News of the Times, Murderous Mondays, The Gildert Street Tragedy. Welcome to News of the Times. In today's episode, we look at a case of spousal abuse leading to murder. Margaret Walber was an exceedingly jealous woman. The Walber marriage was not a happy one. One day, John Walber's ex-partner returns to town and John is caught visiting the ex by Margaret, and his doom is set, as Margaret initially chains him up in the attic, keeping him prisoner. This astonishing case from 1893 was unusual with an abusive wife, and shocking that a man could be locked up, completely known by several people, without any kind of aid being given. A case of twists and turns as the murderer initially accuses her own son rather than takes the blame. A case of abuse leading to murder is today's episode of Murderous Mondays. We hope you enjoy the show. Background. In 1889, Margaret Murray, aged 48, and John Walber, aged 50, married. Together they managed a grocery shop situated at 6 Gildert Street in Liverpool. Their abode was a substantial structure with upper floors housing John Murray, Margaret's son from her previous marriage, along with lodgers James Pearson and his girlfriend Mary Vouse. The downstairs portion of the house had been converted into a small grocery and provision shop. By the autumn of 1893, the Walbers had been married for five years, unhappily. Both Margaret and John were known to drink heavily, further adding to the combustible nature of their relationship. As later attested by John Murray, Margaret's son, John was neither violent nor abusive when under the influence, but Margaret was. A historic romance. Some year, 17 years before, John had been living with Anne Connolly. The pair had split amicably. In the spring of 1893, Anne took lodgings at a house in Oak Street, not far from the Walbers shop, and John rediscovered her and visited her. Margaret Walber was a very jealous woman. When word reached her that her husband had been visiting the house of his old flame, she became enraged. She accused her husband of rekindling his romance with Anne Connolly, but he repeatedly denied the accusations. Still, rumours persisted, and one afternoon in May, Margaret decided to find out for herself if they were true. Walber left the house saying that he was going for a drink, and as he walked off down the street, she crept out of the door and followed him. She watched him cross London Road, making his way down Oaks Street, and enter a house. Convinced now of his infidelity, Margaret Walber stormed up to the front door, burst in and set about her husband with feet and fists, until... When her initial anger was sated, she walked out and slammed the door. When John Walbert returned home later, they continued to quarrel until he finally collapsed in a drunken heap. When he awoke, he found the extent that his infidelity had enraged his wife. She had, with the help from her son, carried her husband into an attic bedroom where she chained him to the wall and kept the door locked with a padlock and chain. For the next four months, Walber never left the room. Indeed, he never left the house alive. He was stripped of his clothes, which she hid in a cellar, and lodgers were told by Margaret that her husband was sick and needed rest. Interestingly, a number of people knew that John was chained up in the attic. Margaret's son, who had helped put him up there, the lodgers, 
James Pearson and Mary Vouse, John's sister and a friend of Margaret's. John's imprisonment in the attic remained undisclosed to the authorities, even though it was evident to many the harsh situation John was in. Margaret confided in a friend of Mary Vouse, revealing that she had confined John to prevent him from frequenting a bad house. She further mentioned that she would provide him with a flypaper, which was a veritable death threat, as flypaper had become famous as a murder weapon since the infamous Maybrick case. In early November, a visit from John's sister prompted a reluctant allowance from Margaret to let her see him. Reportedly, he lay on the bed, appearing bewildered. During the visit, he expressed his being unwell to his sister. Concerned, the sister offered to fetch a doctor or a priest, but Margaret insisted that their service was unnecessary, astonishingly. The sister did not go to the police or any authority. The Crime On the 15th of November, 1893, Margaret and Mary Vouse visited a local pub, where they were later joined by Ellen Mottram. During this encounter, Margaret reportedly offered money to Ellen to vandalise Anne Connolly's windows and also issued threats to kill John. Subsequently, Margaret and Mary returned to the house. On the 16th of November, Margaret Walber went to the bank and withdrew over four pounds. She then proceeded to get drunk. The lodgers later reported hearing sounds of a great disturbance coming from the attic. Margaret then confessed to Vouse that her son had beaten her husband to death, stolen the money she had drawn out, and fled. The police were called in and found John Walber lying in a pool of blood on the attic floor. He had been lashed repeatedly with a chain and then battered to death with the heavy porcelain chamber pot. There were streaks of blood on all of the walls and on the bed. From the Birmingham Daily Post, 21st of November, 1893, yesterday at Liverpool, before W. J. Stewart, Margaret Walber, an elderly woman, was charged with having caused the death of her husband, John Walber, on Thursday last. Chief Detective Inspector Grubb said that the prisoner was the wife of the man who was found murdered in his house in Gildert Street. On Friday morning, she and everyone in the house were brought to the detective's office by Detective Bryson and Ramage, and she made the following statement to them of her own free will. On Thursday afternoon, my son came downstairs and told me that John had on his trousers and was lying on the floor. I went up and he was lying on the floor and he would not speak to me. I took the chain off the door. I thought he was shamming, and I struck him across the head with the chain. I came downstairs then. My husband had been going to a house in Oak Street, kept by a woman named Alice Connolly, and he robbed my shop, taking tobacco and tea to her. I took him back, and he always pretended to be bad and well, and wanted to get out and I had to chain him into the bedroom and take his clothes from him and put them in the cellar. When my son told me that my husband was up and had his trousers on, I was angry and thought he was only acting again to get out. When I struck him across the head with the chain, he never spoke. I was drunk at the time, and I don't remember what more I did to him. Mrs. Pearson called me downstairs and told me that my son had gone. I went down and missed four pounds from my purse. I had not seen my son since the row with Mrs. Smith, and I've never seen him 
since. When I got up next morning, I never thought of what I had done to my husband, but looked for my son, and I saw my husband lying on the floor. I told my clergyman that I was keeping my husband in, and he said, you are doing quite right. I make this statement of my own free will, and, and it's the truth as far as I know. Evidence was given by Detective Ramage that on the morning of the 17th inst, he went to the house of the deceased in Gildert Street, and finding the man lying dead on the floor, he took the prisoner down to the detective's office, where she made the statement, which has just been read. A remand of seven days was granted, and the prisoner, who seemed to be in a dazed condition, was removed. The Escape as this is what it appeared to be of John Murray, Margaret's son, made him a suspect as an accessory to his mother's crime. Police are out in full force and find him quickly. From the Liverpool Echo, the 27th of November, 1893, the Gilded Street Tragedy. Blood found on Murray's clothes. At the coroner's court today, Mr. T. E. Sampson, coroner for Liverpool, resumed the inquiry into the death of John Walber, who resided at Gildert Street, London Road, and was found dead under tragic circumstances already reported. The wife of the deceased is in custody for causing the death of the man. A warrant has just been granted by Mr. Stewart for the arrest of Murray, the stepson. Murray has been detained in Dublin, and at the Dublin Police Court on Saturday he was remanded till Wednesday. On Murray's clothes some blood has been found. He absconded from the house in Gildert Street, and he was seen at about two o'clock in the street the afternoon of the day of the murder. He arrived in Dublin on the day following and passed under an assumed name in a lodging house. With the quick capture of John Murray, Margaret's son, his testimony is taken, giving a full picture of the murder of his stepfather, John Walber. From the Liverpool Echo, the 1st of December, 1893, the Gildert Street tragedy, Murray before the magistrate, statement by the prisoner. John Murray, stepson, of the man John Walber, who was murdered at his house in Gildert Street, was brought before Mr. Stewart this morning at the city police court, charged with being concerned with his mother, who is in custody in the murder. Mr. Moss stated that the prisoner was charged with the murder of his stepfather. He had made a statement, and for the purpose of making inquiries as to the truth of his statement, he, Mr. Moss, asked for a remand until Monday next. Detective Sergeant Ramage deposed to receiving the prisoner. John Murray from the police in Dublin, where he had been arrested. After being cautioned, the prisoner made the following statement. About three o'clock on Thursday, Mother came back from the post office bank. She was a bit drunk and she sat down by the fire, and then she had a row with Smith, the woman that lives next door. I sent twice for ale for her. She made me send for it. I wanted her to go to bed. She went upstairs, and I tried to keep her from going, as I wanted to go to bed. We went into the room, and the old man was sitting on the floor. He had my trousers on. My mother showed him four sovereigns in her hand. There was nothing wrong with him then. Only there was something wrong with his leg. I went downstairs then, and I heard a noise in the top room, and I rushed up again. The old man was lying along by the bed on the floor. His head was cut, and there was blood all about the floor. I strove to get my mother down. She was standing by the side of the room door. I never saw her striking him or anything. 
I turned the old man over towards the window and saw that he was dead. I tried to drag mother down, and she struck me twice on the nose and made me bleed. She then gave me two sovereigns, and two sovereigns dropped onto the floor. She made me pick them up. I was frightened then, and I ran up to Garston. I put my organ and violin into the cellar before I went away. I declare all this to be the candid truth, and I make this statement of my own free will. I cannot write my name, but will make my cross. The prisoner was remanded till Monday. Investigations continue as neighbours and the house lodgers are questioned. John Murray, the son, is cleared. The full weight of the murder falls on Margaret Walber, the victim's wife. From the Liverpool Echo, the 4th of December, 1893, the Gilded Street tragedy, the discharge of Murray. The young man, John Murray, was brought up on remand before Mr. Stewart at the City Police Court today, charged with being concerned in the willful murder of his stepfather. It will be remembered that the prisoner made a statement in regard to the affair on Friday. Remand was granted in order that the police might make inquiries. Mr. Moss now stated that the police would offer no evidence against the prisoner, and he was accordingly discharged. The Inquest. Verdict of Willful Murder. Mr. Sampson, City Coroner, held an inquiry opening at noon today at the Coroner's Court into the circumstances attending the death of John Walber, aged 55 years, who is alleged to have been murdered on Gildert Street on the 16th of November. The evidence of neighbours showed that the deceased and his wife lived very unhappily. The latter was jealous of Anne Connolly, an old sweetheart of Walbur's. Mrs. Walbur used to boast that she kept her husband tied to prevent him going to see Connolly, and she had been heard to say she would give him a flypaper. Anne Connolly, a single woman living at 11 Oaks Street, said she had known the deceased John Walbur for over 30 years. Seventeen years ago she had lived with the deceased for some months, but prior to May last, had only seen him twice during the last seventeen years. She remembered that on the 2nd of May the deceased John Walber came to her house and was followed there by his wife. She, Anne Connolly, told him that she did not want to have anything more to do with him and ordered him out. His wife then came and struck him several times and said, he need not come back to her. She went out, and the deceased, John Walber, soon followed after. Witness saw nothing more of the deceased until she heard of his death. Police Constable 135B said that about half past ten on Friday the 17th, he was called to the house in 4 Gildert Street, where he found the deceased body in the bedroom. The furniture in the room was disarranged and some broken crockery and lamps were scattered about the floor. He found a small bunch of hair on the floor. There were severe wounds on the deceased's right cheekbone, the front of the forehead and on the bridge of the nose, beside small cuts and wounds over the face and forehead. Deceased face was covered with blood, which was dry when witness examined it. Police Constable 126D disposed to removing the body of the deceased from Gildert Street to the Prince's Dock Mercury the afternoon of the 17th. Detective Inspector Bryson gave evidence in corroboration of the first constable's statement. He noticed that the walls of the bedroom were in many places smeared with blood and bore indications of heavy articles having been thrown against them. Dr. Kellett Smith, demonstrator of anatomy at the University College, said he visited 
for Gildert Street on the 17th. The cause of death, in his opinion, was due to hemorrhage, combined with certain amounts of shock and loss of blood from injuries which were not self-inflicted. The wounds and injuries were very severe, and must have been caused by great violence and brutality. Witness had examined the clothing worn by Mrs. Wolber and knives and other things handed over to him by the police, and had found blood on the clothes and lampstand, but not on the knives. He had also examined the clothes of the son, John Murray, but found nothing except a small patch of blood on the front of the coat. In summing up the evidence, the coroner said that the woman had a case to answer, and the jury would no doubt return a verdict of willful murder against her. She, at any rate, was our participator in what was done, if indeed she did not do all the work herself. The only evidence against the son, John Murray, was his mother's statement, and that could not be accepted. Then again, in future verbal statements, she had exculpated her son. The jury returned a verdict of willful murder against the woman and stated that there was not sufficient evidence to find a similar verdict against John Murray. The case goes to trial, but it is a foregone conclusion Margaret Walber is found guilty of the murder of her husband. The case created considerable interest. A case of an abusive wife was unusual at the time, but not unheard of. More unusually was that a man could be knowingly chained up for several months without anyone thinking to contact the authorities. With the advent of the NSPCC, the National Society for the Prevention of Cruelty to Children, in 1884, and many notable successes there, a call is put forward for a society to protect the aged. This case of Margaret Walber being used as, a, as an example of why it was necessary. Margaret Walber stood trial before Justice Day on the 14th of March at Liverpool Assizes in the Grand Courtroom of St George's Hall in Liverpool. Witnesses Mary Vouse and James Pearson provided testimony against Margaret, which was supplemented by initial forensic evidence indicating blood splatter on Margaret's clothing. The trial lasted over a day, but with the prosecutor putting forward such a strong case, it didn't take the jury long to bring in a verdict of guilty. From the Liverpool Echo, the 15th of March, 1894. Without any recommendations to mercy from the jury, and without the shadow of an expression of hope from the bench, the Crown Court in St George's was yesterday the scene of the condemnation to death of a woman for a crime characterised by some remarkable and in gruesome surroundings. The wretched person thus dismissed to her doom, Margaret Walby by name, and fifty-three years of age, resided in Gildert Street, where she kept a small provision shop. Five years ago she wedded her second husband, John Walber, a French polisher, two years her senior. The union proved an unhappy one both of the parties being addicted to drink. But the miserably squalid story of the man's life was not without its element of romance, culminating in a terrible tragedy. Walber had an old sweetheart, a woman whom he knew long ago, but until May last had not seen her for a period of seventeen years. Walber's visit to the house of his former lover became known to his wife, who, with the green-eyed monster of jealousy raging within her breast, followed him, discovered him, and there and then swore vengeance against him. Her threats proved to be no idle ones. 
Walbert was a quiet, easy-going man, willing to submit to a great deal for the sake of peace. Here his wife committed him to a living tomb in their squalid mansion, fastening him up under chain and padlock in a wretched garret, in which he remained a close prisoner day and night from the early part of May till last November, when he was found dead, his body a mass of wounds and beaten in parts almost to jelly. The miserable man's sad plight was no close secret. The woman's explanation to her neighbours was that she kept him prisoner to prevent him going to visit his former sweetheart. The learned judge may well have expressed surprise that at the end of the nineteenth century, here in the heart of Liverpool, a person should be imprisoned, and that his friends and neighbours should know about it, and that they should not interfere. The indifference or bluntness of the moral perceptions indirectly led to the loss of one life, and is now likely to witness the forfeiture of another. Not content with immuring her unfortunate husband, the woman continued to preach vengeance against him, and one day, in an excess of passion, excited largely, no doubt, by drink, took her poor captive's life, and for this heartless and inexcusable murder of a defenceless man, prematurely aged and broken down, Margaret Wolber lies today under sentence of death. A society for the protection of the aged, the helpless, and the infirm, somewhat on the lines of the splendid institution which has accomplished so much in shielding children from cruel or neglectful guardians, seems suggested by this shocking narrative of slum life. Such society, if it did nothing else, might at all events create public opinion which would make it impossible for persons in any walk of life to stand by unmoved month after month while witnessing the infliction upon a fellow being of abominable hardship and an unwarranted captivity, all too likely one day to terminate in a terrible crime. Margaret was hanged on Easter Monday, April the 2nd, 1894, by James Billington. As with previous executions carried out at Walton, the press were not admitted, although the governor told the coroner's inquest, held later that afternoon, that she had walked to the gallows with a steady step, and that death was instant. That concludes this episode of Murderous Mondays, the Gilded Street Tragedy. We very much hope you enjoyed the show. If you did enjoy the show, we will be grateful if you could like or subscribe to our little channel. We upload five days a week. Mondays are murderous as we delve into the dark side of Regency and Victorian crime. Wednesdays are wicked, where we pull together stories with a similar theme, such as Doctors of Death. Fridays are frightful where we look at crimes in a location, such as stories from the stage to murder and scandal in the aristocracy. Saturdays is Serial Killer Saturdays, where we investigate serial killer stories from the past. And Sundays is a bit of fun, with a unique mini murder mystery where you, the listener, have a chance to solve a murderous riddle. On the last Sunday of the month, we offer a two-hour compilation of stories based around a theme. Thank you again for watching and listening. This has been News of the Times, and I am Robin Coles.